1983, a revolutionary card game was published by Avalon Hill. The game foreshadowed in some ways the coming collectible and trading card games of the 1990s. Up Front, designed by Courtney Allen, is a squad-level man-to-man combat game that can be played solitaire, by two players, three players, or in teams. However, it is primarily designed as a two-player tournament-style war game. Upfront and its expansions Banzai and Desert War offer soldiers from the seven major nations that participated in World War II. The US, UK, France, Russia, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Originally released by Avalon Hill, Upfront is now offered by War Games Vault and the base game consists of the following components. 162 playing cards, 120 infantry cards, 40 ABF cards, 304 counters, rule book, and 12 scenarios. The base game comes with German, US, and Russian forces. The Banzai expansion adds the Japanese and the UK, while Desert War adds the Italians and the French. You can purchase the game through War Games Vault as a bundle or in separate components. You can buy everything that was included in the original release of the game, save for the box and card tray. War Games Vault does add two items, decks for the desert and jungle combat that were suggested in the original rules. Upfront does not attempt to recreate a specific battle, but rather the opening skirmish between a small number of enemy forces before they are reinforced. The sandbox approach allows you to recreate small sections of any battles fought during World War II that included at least two nationalities represented in the game. There is no map. You set up your squad according to the scenario instructions. You can set up your forces using the suggested soldiers, or you can choose to design your own forces by using the points that are printed for each scenario. Your squad, which consists of individual soldiers, is divided into two, three, or four groups at the beginning of each game. Each nationality will have standard soldiers, an assistant squad leader, and squad leaders. The Russians will have a commissar in the ranks as well. The soldiers are armed mostly with semi-automatic rifles, but some may carry submachine guns, light machine guns, mortars, and flamethrowers. Advanced rules bring in infantry guns and tanks to the game. You can create unique squads for tournament-style matches, such as with the City Fight 501 and 4 system, which will be discussed in another video. Each soldier card has a front which shows its unpinned side, you can see the firepower produced by the soldier according to its range from the enemy. In addition, they have a morale rating on the lower left corner, and a killed in action number as well. Flipping the soldier card to the back side shows its pin status. When pinned, they cannot fire, and if they panic, they leave the game. Each player gets a hand of action cards based on their nationality. The cards allow your groups to move, find terrain, fire on an opponent, conceal themselves from attack, and more. The action cards are the heart of the game. You start your turn, play as many action cards as you want, or you can discard up to the limit as set by your nationality. Draw back up to your hand capacity and then sit back and watch your opponent do the same. Well, it may not quite be the same. The seven nations represented in the game are not only distinctive because of their colors and weapons, but also because of their hand capacity and discard ability for action cards. The Italians, Japanese, and Russians have a hand capacity of four, the UK and Germans a hand capacity of five, and the Americans and French a hand capacity of six. In most cases, you must either play cards in the hand or discard depending on the limits as dictated by the nationality. The Germans may discard one card no matter how many action cards they have played, and the Japanese may move and still discard. All other nationalities may not both play and discard action cards in the same turn. Two of the most important terms for upfront players are random number card or RNC and random position card or RPC. The random number card refers to the number located in the upper right corner of the action card. Black numbers are positive while red numbers are negative. They are used to determine a random event much in the same manner as dice. A random position card uses numbers along the bottom row to randomly determine a position within a group. Put simply, when you need to resolve a random event, check the RNC, or you attack a group and consult the RPC to see which one or more soldiers you affect. Combining simple mechanics with exceptional play and a wide variety of choices, Upfront is one of the best sandbox-type war games on the market. 
It offers players the ability to recreate different sections of famous battles in a quick play format. Although the game itself has a substantial set of rules, the basic concepts of Upfront are fairly easy to grasp. What follows is a condensed version of how the game typically plays from setup to how the turn sequence plays out. Keep in mind that not every nuance of the rules will be covered. This video is to help you grasp the basic concept of how the game plays. Place your nation's forces into two, three, or four groups. Each group can number from two up to ten soldiers. From left to right, the soldiers occupy positions inside each group as numbers one, two, three, and so forth. Your groups start at range zero. Each group may take a single action per turn. You may play one of the following actions for each group. Move, enter terrain, fire, rally, and other activities as dictated by the cards. You must complete one action for one group before taking another action with another group. The non-active player may not take any actions during the active player's turn, save for playing a concealment or hero card. At the end of your turn, redraw your hand until it reaches the maximum allowed limit. You may move any group so long as all the soldiers are not pinned. You may place a movement card to advance, retreat, or go sideways to another group location. When you advance, increase the range chit by one. Decrease by one when you retreat. Moving adds plus one to the fire modifier when the group is fired upon. Keep in mind that you count the underlying terrain card, if any, when applying the plus one modifier on your group when it is fired at by the enemy. To fire at the enemy with a group, you add up the firepower rating of all the soldiers who are not pinned. You can play a fire card, whose firepower number in the circle is equal or less than the firepower rating of the group. You can play more than one fire card, as long as the total is less than or equal to the firepower rating of the group. Now add up the fire strengths of the fire cards that have been played, and modify by terrain, concealment, and movement. And now draw an action card for each soldier in the enemy group by position. If the total is greater than the KIA number of the soldier, he dies. If the total is less than the KIA number, but greater than the morale number, the soldier is pinned. If the soldier is already pinned, a number greater than the panic number means the soldier runs away. If the number under the 0R column on the bottom of the card is less than the panic number, the soldier is killed. When you advance a group, the range marker will change. All groups start at range 0. When you advance a group, the marker changes to range 1, and so forth. To determine the relative range between your groups and an enemy group that is opposite your own or in adjacent groups, add up the two numbers. When the numbers add up to 5, both groups are at point-blank range. If the numbers are separated by more than one letter, say group A and group C, then subtract one from the final range calculation. The hand size of your forces begin with the nationality of your soldiers. For example, the Americans will have a hand size of six cards. However, if the squad leader is pinned, the hand size is reduced by one card until he rallies. If the squad leader is killed, the hand size is reduced by one for one turn and then brought back up again if you have an assistant squad leader who is not pinned or dead. If both the squad leader and assistant squad leader are killed, your hand size is reduced permanently by one card. If you only have one group left, then your opponent's hand size is permanently increased by one. You may rally from one to six soldiers depending on the number displayed on the rally card. A rally all card means that all soldiers in the group are rallied, or all soldiers in two adjacent groups if they are at the same range and at least one group has an unpinned squad leader, assistant squad leader, or commissar. Two non-adjacent groups may be rallied by a rally all card if both groups have an unpinned leader. A hero card allows you to unpin a single soldier and double their firepower for the turn, except for those armed with a light machine gun who use the bracketed firepower. Remember that playing a hero card is not considered an action and can be used by the non-active player to unpin a soldier before an attack is resolved. Victory is achieved in upfront when one of the following conditions is met. Fulfill the victory conditions of the scenario, lose up to one half of your own soldiers, or count up victory points that have been achieved when the final deck runs out. Upfront is a relatively simple game to play. Understanding the basic sequence will help you learn the game although keeping the rulebook handy will be helpful when faced with the more complex rules and interaction of the game.
While Upfront is primarily designed as a two-player, tournament-style war game, it can be played solitaire successfully with only small modifications. Keep in mind that the solitaire rules are meant to be used when playing both sides to the best of your ability. There is no smart bot or other artificial intelligence operating the opposing side. You represent both sides of the battle. Although the game is arguably better with at least two players, the solitaire rules allow you to maintain some of the hidden information that makes Upfront a unique gaming experience. What follows are the solitaire rules as shown in the Banzai Rulebook, Section 49. All actions performed during a player turn must be pre-designated before they are resolved. The result is that all actions are considered to happen simultaneously, so you do not know the result of one action before the rest. Place both hands of cards face up on the table. Cards that are drawn from the action deck are placed face down. Do not reveal the cards until the following has taken place. The player turn is over. The opposing side has attacked. The opposing side has discarded a terrain card on one of its moving groups. Whichever happens first will reveal the cards. Because you will not know the information on the unrevealed cards until they are ready to be played, it will change the dynamic of how the game proceeds. Do you keep the cards unrevealed or play them quickly at the last minute? It's important that you play both sides to the best of your ability. This means getting the most out of the nationalities represented, using the resources available, and striving toward the victory conditions. What follows is the Solitaire Rules variant as suggested by David Hassel in his article found on the Upfront Board Game Geek section. It follows the same structure as the Solo Rules of Banzai. The opposing player's cards are not revealed when drawn, but are revealed at the end of the turn or when triggered by other conditions, such as seeking a concealment card. The difference is that each side will have a sideboard similar to the game structure of Magic the Gathering. You deal cards equally to the nationality requirements face down at the beginning of the game. Then, you add three cards face down to each side separately. This is a sideboard and it's not to be inspected. When you draw cards to refill your hand, draw them face down and turn the rest of the cards in your hand face down along with those in the sideboard. Shuffle them together and then pull out three cards to put into your sideboard. Keep the rest as part of your hand. When inspecting the opposing side's hand for a concealment card, inspect their hand, then afterwards shuffle it into their sideboard cards and deal out three to keep in the sideboard. Make sure the cards are face down. This option creates some interesting situations. For example, if you want to play two cards one at a time over two turns, then the second card might disappear into the sideboard when they are shuffled. For example, playing a movement card while having a terrain card in hand. Shuffling between turns and discovering the terrain card is gone. Although such an event can happen in real life, it can be pretty annoying to the upfront player. A solution would be to reserve a single card in your hand and then set it aside as the shuffling process commences. Return the card to the hand once you have completed your shuffle. This allows you to keep valuable terrain, fire card, or other important card for the next turn. Another side effect is that pulling three additional cards from each side may shorten the game. To overcome this, you simply shuffle and return the sideboard cards once the draw pile has been depleted at the end of the game. Of course, this variant does not work if you are playing up front on Vassal, but the variant does provide for a solution that uses dice. Playing up front solitaire may not be what the game was designed for, but it is one that can be enjoyable when you have no one else around. Combat in up front is not just about closing distance and shooting. Your forces can also infiltrate and conduct close combat with the enemy. Infiltration can be performed when an enemy group is at relative range 5. You may commit one or more unpinned soldiers to that effort. Soldiers in wire or a minefield may not attempt infiltration. A soldier attempting infiltration must either pass a morale check or they may play a movement card. A Ford movement card is required if a soldier is in a stream. Otherwise, a Ford check will have to be made. Two movement cards are required for infiltration to occur from marsh terrain. If you decide on a morale check, you will have to draw a random number card or RNC. The color of the RNC will not apply for this morale check. If the RNC is less than the current morale of the soldier, then he passes. If it is equal to or greater than their morale, the soldier fails to infiltrate 
and is pinned. Once the movement card has been played or the morale check passed, the next step is to see if the infiltration was successful. Draw an RPC, look at the columns on the bottom row, and find the one that matches the number of unpinned soldiers of the enemy group. If the number in the column is red, the infiltration succeeds. If it is black, the infiltration fails. Keep in mind that there are modifiers which may shift the column that is to be checked. A one column shift to the left occurs for every concealment card the infiltrator plays or if the infiltration is coming from the woods. A two column shift to the left if the infiltration is coming from brush or smoke. A one column shift to the right occurs when the infiltration comes from a hill, open ground, or goes into a pillbox. A two column shift to the right occurs when soldiers of the infiltrating or defending groups are moving or if the enemy group is currently infiltrated. If the infiltration is successful, the first option for the soldier is to double his firepower, which will lose his infiltration status. Infiltration status may also be lost if the soldier is pinned, his group moves, or if the enemy group plays a terrain card at relative range 4 or moves to relative range 3. Another option is to enter close combat. You draw an RPC to determine which enemy soldier will be engaged in close combat. Soldiers have a close combat value, or CCV, stated on their cards. Keep in mind that if a soldier changes their weapon, it will change their CCV. Once the pairing has been made, the defender may play a single concealment card to lower the attacker's CCV. Conversely, the attacker may play a single concealment card to lower the defender's CCV. At this point, both the attacker and defender draw an RNC, which is added to their CCC value. Whichever soldier has the lower CCV value dies in close combat. If the result is a tie, both soldiers are killed. If the attacker wins, he loses his infiltration status unless he prevailed by three or more. In addition, whoever won the close combat may keep the weapon of the soldier who was killed. Keep in mind that multiple attackers may all attack the same defender and crewed members of a weapon can defend together. If the last soldier of a group that has been infiltrated has been killed, the terrain that the soldier occupied along with any entrenchments that were dug now belong to the opposing group. All movement cards that were in play for the now destroyed group are discarded. The Russians offer an interesting take on close combat. If a pinned Russian soldier at relative range 5 suffers a panic attack, he goes berserk instead. A Berserk soldier automatically enters close combat without having to infiltrate at the start of his turn regardless if his group was not allowed to enter close combat. There is no morale check or infiltration attempt needed and it does not cost the group their action for the turn. Draw an RPC to determine which opposing soldier he engages. He attacks using his pinned CCV. If victorious, he rallies and is no longer pinned. If the soldier who went Berserk crewed a weapon, he leaves the weapon behind and attacks unarmed. If he wins, he stays unarmed until paying an action to draw a black RNC. Keep in mind that soldiers who crew an infantry gun are not subject to going berserk. If the opposing group moved away from relative range 5 after the soldier went berserk, but before the following game turn, then the berserk soldier rallies instead and probably hurls some invectives at the retreating soldiers. Up front allows you to close with enemy soldiers, infiltrate their groups, and conduct hand-to-hand -hand or close combat to eliminate them from the field. The advanced rules of Upfront introduce new weapons and armored fighting vehicles to the mix. You can now include tanks and other armored vehicles in your design your own scenarios. Armored fighting vehicles, or AFVs, operate in a similar fashion to soldiers with some exceptions. The fire strength number on AFVs are not modified when the vehicle is on the move, but it does subtract one from the to hit factor, or THF. AFVs cannot enter marsh and must reject all marsh cards played on it by the opponent. In addition, AFVs may enter woods terrain, but to leave they must play a sideways movement card. Keep in mind that playing a movement card sideways will open the AFV to flanking fire. When entering a gully, woods, wire, or stream, you must check for bog. The procedure is simple enough. 
draw a random position check, use the column for the AFV bog number on the card. However, use the W number if a wire card has been played. If the number is red, place the bog chit on the AFV. This is when you discard the movement cards. If the number is black, then it passes the bog check. Keep in mind that you can reject some of the terrain, such as the stream. However, you must make this decision before the bog results can be checked. As you might expect, an AFV cannot move when it is bogged down. Any movement cards that were in play on the vehicle are removed. You can still fire the weapons without any penalty. If you are firing on enemy groups or units, you must decide whether to use the boxed or unboxed effect numbers. You cannot use both with the same attack. A successful attack on an AFV may result in the target being stunned, immobilized, or eliminated. If the results are immobilization or stunned, draw an RPC with red meaning immobilized, while black means stunned. Against attacks from armored vehicles, the armored and flank values are used. You cannot play conceal cards against an enemy attacking your AFV. Plus, AFVs that are in a hull down mode do not receive any terrain effects modifiers for their defense. Against unboxed fire attacks or unboxed effect numbers, the morale and CE defense values are used. This means that the defending TEM on the AFV will not have any effect on fire attacks and may affect either morale or CE defense values. If the attack result is greater than the morale, then the AFV becomes buttoned up or pinned. If the attack result is greater than the CE, then the commander is killed as a result. There are different types of damage that your AFV will suffer depending on the hit results. If the result is being buttoned up, then only the hero card will unbutton the unit. Remember that you may button up the AFV as part of an action if you desire. A pinned result means that you cannot move or fire the unit. You will need a Rally 3 card or greater to become unpinned. However, you may combine smaller Rally cards over different turns to reach that number. A Commander Killed result means that the strength of your THF and OVR are reduced by a single point along with the non-ordnance fire attacks. A second Commander Killed result reduces the THF and non-ordnance fire by two along with being more vulnerable to infiltrators. A third Commander Killed result means that the AFV is destroyed. Becoming immobilized means that your AFV cannot move and a second immobilized will stun the vehicle. It is no longer considered a moving target. Remove any single movement card present and flip the second to open terrain. The AFV will defend using its flanked anti-armor value. A stun 3 means no movement or fire. Flip to its buttoned up or pinned side and it is immobilized. A Rally 3 card allows the vehicle to recover. However, a second stun result will require a Rally 6 to remove, but a Rally All will unpin and remove the stun chit. If the AFV is stunned again while at a stun 6, it is eliminated. Although similar to tanks, there are a few differences that you need to know. Hitting a moving target reduces the THF of the assault gun by 1. You may not fire an assault gun while it is moving and assault guns that are immobilized or otherwise bogged down subtract two from the THF. There are more rules governing how AFVs move, attack, and fire, but this is a basic rundown that will help you better understand how armored fighting vehicles work in the upfront system. The heart of the upfront system is the group formations that each squad may create when engaging in combat. The personality cards are set up in two, three, or four groups on the table. Each group will normally have its own function within the game to achieve victory under the scenario conditions. However, not all groups may have the same methods in achieving such goals. This normally means assigning specific goals to achieve the desired results. What follows are three examples of groups that may be created from most scenarios and up front. Normally consisting of at least 50% of the squad, the firebase is formed around a main heavy weapon such as a light or medium machine gun. The firebase is primarily designed to pin down and control enemy activity. This allows other groups to get into a better position. The firebase may also be the main focus for achieving victory through attrition. The maneuver group generally consists of two to four soldiers. 
The soldiers normally have the highest morale so they can resist getting pinned by enemy fire. This group will advance toward the enemy to create a flanking position or achieving one of the victory conditions, such as in the patrol scenario. The maneuver group is often built around short-ranged, but highly effective weapons such as the submachine gun or a flamethrower. The drill group normally consists of the lowest morale soldiers whose sole purpose is to extend the line. They will often be in group A and try to find a gully or other protective terrain at the first opportunity. The main goal of the drill group is to not get pinned or killed. That may be a tougher goal to realize given their low morale, but at least they do not affect larger groups if they should become pinned. The drill group should be placed in group A to help extend the line. However, they can also be placed between larger groups, such as in group B or group C, depending on the number of soldiers available. Sometimes a drill group may include a soldier armed with a mortar. Since the mortar can hit any part of the battlefield, it should seek protection much like that of the low morale soldiers. Plus, mortars can burn away otherwise unusable fire cards. Remember that you can only transfer soldiers at the same range. Keep in mind that after both sides have set up, you and your opponent can place one terrain card each on an opposing group, even Marsh, without the possibility of rejection. By building your groups within your personality cards to fulfill specific tasks, you can utilize each group to its full potential when playing up front. Although there are only two hero cards in the action deck, their importance depends largely on the timing of when they're played and whether the nationality can afford to keep one in their hand. The hero card is arguably the most versatile in the action deck. First and foremost, the play of the hero card is free. It does not cost an action to use the card. Furthermore, it can be played at any time, even during an opponent's turn. If you play the hero card immediately when drawn from the draw pile, you may draw another card. This is the only card in the action deck that allows you to draw an additional card, but only when it has been immediately played. Probably the most known of its abilities is to rally a single soldier at any time. This includes soldiers who were pinned while trying to infiltrate an enemy group or engage in close combat. This means that you can try to infiltrate the group again with the same soldier. Playing the hero card before an opponent's AFV overrun attack is resolved will reduce the RNC for that resolution by one. Playing the hero card will double the firepower of any soldier for one turn. If a soldier has already doubled the firepower ability, the addition of a hero card will triple it. On machine guns, the doubled or tripled firepower applies to the bracketed firepower number even if the weapon is fully crewed. Exceptions are mortars, AFVs, and infantry guns. An anti-tank weapon can improve its two-hit frequency by one, whether fully crewed or not. But it only applies to ranges in which the anti-tank weapon can be used. A hero card can suspend all effects from a wound on a soldier for one turn. If a second hero card is played, then that soldier may for one turn engage in all the abilities provided by the hero card. The soldier returns to his wounded state after that turn. You can use the hero card on a wounded soldier before he has to make an endurance check at the end of the round. This may keep a soldier alive who otherwise might die if they fail the check. Keep in mind that you cannot play a hero card on an infantry gun or AFV unless it is added as a credit toward rallying a pinned soldier or stunned unit. However, there are two exceptions to this rule. If an attack on an AFV results in a pin, a hero card may negate that result if the commander has not been killed in the same attack. Plus, a buttoned up AFV can be flipped back to its CE side, assuming that it is not stunned or subject to a commander killed result. You cannot play a hero card to double the firepower of an AFV. Finally, if you rally a pin squad leader with a hero card you play off the top of the deck, you can then draw not one, but two new cards for your side. The hero card is the most versatile, and yet the most difficult card to keep, especially for nationalities that have small hand sizes. Playing Scenario C, Assaulting a Fortification, the pillbox offers an interesting challenge for upfront players. 
Understanding how pill boxes work will help you better prepare for the experience. The pill box is placed in Group B at the beginning of the game. Although it providing considerable protection for the occupants inside, it is also rather cramped as you might expect. No more than three soldiers may occupy the pill box at any time. The group is also limited in the type of weapons that can be used inside the pill box. That means no bazookas, panzerkrecks, mortars, or secondary weapons may be used. Plus, do not expect to cram an infantry gun or AFV inside a pill box. In addition, minefield and sniper cards are treated as cower cards if held by the player on offense. The defensive player who has the pill box may use the minefield and sniper cards as normal. All marsh cards are treated as cower cards. To win, the attacker must either eliminate all personality cards inside the pill box or the pill box must be abandoned by the defending player. Of course, the pill box itself cannot move, however the soldiers inside may enter or leave the pill box just like any other terrain feature. Because the pillbox cannot move, you cannot use conceal cards to lessen the attack value. In addition, ordnance, which attacks the pillbox, may use their unboxed effect number. However, there are some considerable advantages for the group inside the pillbox. Namely, that pillboxes are not subject to close combat, overruns, and attackers from hills may not employ the plus one modifier. In addition, Normal flanking fire will be ineffective against a pillbox. The one exception is when an attacker retreats or pulls back from relative range 5. This allows them to use flanking fire against the pillbox. The occupants of the pillbox may only attack behind them at relative range 5. Their fire strength will be reduced by one half under such circumstances. Those inside the pillbox may not infiltrate groups in front or behind them. Pillboxes may be infiltrated by the attacker. This will allow the use of doubled firepower or a demolition charge against the pillbox. Scenario C presents a daunting challenge for the defender. For design your own purposes, the 200 points is considerably less compared to the 369 points for the attacker. This means that careful consideration for the soldiers and weapons purchased to help maximize the defense of the pillbox. Whether playing a designated scenario against armored vehicles or creating your own squad for 501 City Fight and 4, having an anti-tank weapon handy may save your squad from being overrun by an armored vehicle. There are four basic anti-tank options for the upfront player. Each option has its own advantages and restrictions. These are two anti-tank weapons used by American and German forces respectively. Both have similar rules for use in up front. Both are considered light anti-tank weapons and must be crewed to use their unboxed firepower rating. You cannot fire either weapon with other weapons in a group, nor can you fire if the soldier or the group they are in is moving. The Panzerfaust is considered a disposable secondary weapon. You can only fire it once and only against targets that have an AFV armored defense value. Like the bazooka, you cannot fire it with other weapons in a group or when moving, but it does have the advantage of never being able to malfunction. This is a light anti-tank weapon that is considered ordnance when firing at an AFV. If you fire it against a personality character, add one FP to the attack. This means that the attack strength of the anti-tank rifle against an AFV will equal the relative range plus a random number card draw with red or black numbers applying. With flanking fire, the hit factor is increased by one, and like the bazooka, the anti-tank rifle cannot fire when moving or with other weapons in a group. These are secondary weapons and may be used to damage or destroy AFVs either in close combat or when defending against an overrun. When using the mine in close combat against an AFV, you add plus four to his close combat value and then discard the mine. If the mine is being used by an unpinned defender against an overrun, 
This assumes that the AFV draws a random number card and fails to pin the defender. Or a hero card may be used to immediately unpin the personality character. The process for using the anti-tank magnetic mine is as follows. The defender draws a random number card. If the number is black, check the column of the number drawn based on the status of the AFV. For buttoned up, 2B, for crew exposed, 4C, and for open top, 5O. If the number is red, check the 0R column of the same random number card. On a result of 1 to 5, the AFV is immobilized. On a result of 6 to 10, the AFV is eliminated. Discard the mine if the result is immobilized or eliminated. And that is how you use anti-tank weapons in Upfront. Soldiers do not just battle each other. The temperature, elements, and ground conditions can also be a formidable foe. While Upfront offers a myriad of rules to cover many different situations, the rulebook itself does not cover the different environmental conditions that soldiers faced. In typical encounters, the conditions for the scenarios are considered to be dry. That means the environmental conditions allow for freedom of movement and good visibility. In Volume 22, Issue Number 3 of The General, Jim Burnett provided his version of environmental rules that are simple to use and quite straightforward. What follows are the five different environmental conditions that you can place on your soldiers in upfront scenarios. These are extremely cold conditions that do not include snowfall. In such conditions, marsh and stream cards are defined in the scenarios as cower cards. Plus, entrenchments are successful with an RNC draw of five or six. Muddy conditions were prevalent in most areas of the war, particularly during the spring months. You must play a sideways movement card first before playing another movement card that may change the range of your group. Subtract one from the fire strength of ordnance with the unbox number. AFVs must check for bog on every movement and terrain card that is played or placed. And infantry guns cannot be moved. Heavy snowfall was a substantial factor in areas such as the Winter War between the Soviets and Finland, the German invasion of Russia, and the Battle of the Bulge. All rules for frozen and mud are used to recreate the conditions of heavy snowfall. The one exception is that digging in an entrenchment is successful on an RNC draw of zero or one. This means light rain or snow, fog, a mist, or blowing sand. To simulate such conditions, the fire strength and the to hit number modifiers are reduced by one. This includes heavy downpours, dense fog, blizzards, and sandstorms that severely curtailed visibility. Each fire strength and to hit number modifier is reduced by two in such conditions. By employing environmental conditions to your scenarios, you can add a touch more realism to your upfront game. From Italy to the Caucasus and the islands of the Philippines and Burma, mountain warfare played a significant role in World War II. For upfront players, the mountains are now within reach thanks to a helpful series of simple rules. Volume 29, issue number 6 of The General featured a simple system for recreating mountain warfare for upfront. The system can be applied to any of the published scenarios in the Upfront rulebook. This is performed by using terrain cards as changes in elevation. The following cards do not retain their terrain features when using mountain rules. Hills and marsh terrain are considered to be at level 1. Buildings minus 2 cards are considered to be level 2 terrain. And building minus 3 cards are considered level 3 terrain. The pillbox is level 4 and considered the highest point of reachable terrain in the game. If the defender gets the pillbox as part of their instructions, then there is no level 4 terrain in the scenario. Streams are considered impassable terrain. They represent the deep crevices and ravines found in the mountains. A stream that is discarded onto a group will remove any movement card that is present, and then the stream itself is discarded. 
The wall functions the same as in the normal game. It can be visualized as the ridge line along the hills and mountains. Woods will either function the same as in the normal game, or they can be considered cower cards depending on the scenario instructions. Brush, gully, and open ground cards function the same in this set of rules as in the normal game. A gully does not provide fire protection from forces one elevation or more higher than the defending group. To move from one elevation to the next, you must play two movement cards. The first movement card is played sideways, which does not provide flanking fire bonuses. The second is played forward and a new elevation card may be played to replace the old one. If you are not changing elevation, then you may move using the standard movement rules. Differences in elevation affect the relative range between opposing groups by one for every level of difference. Groups one elevation higher or more than a defender may add plus one to their fire strength. The only exception is the group inside the pillbox. A group that is firing from a lower elevation than its target will have one removed for every level it is below. AFVs start at elevation zero and may not change, although they may move around normally. Plus, if fired at by ordnance at level two, they must defend using their flank armor and infantry guns may not be moved once placed at the beginning of the scenario. And that is the gist of the mountain rules for up front. Unlike today's modern forces that have night vision goggles, the soldiers who fought during World War II had no such equipment. But that didn't stop the soldiers from fighting at night. Under the night rules and up front, before forces can engage in combat, they must detect the opposing group first. That means that each group must detect one opposing group before it can open fire. The exceptions are for sniper and minefield attacks, or placing terrain on an enemy group, which does not require observation. The observation step is used to detect the opposing group. To do so, the players must draw an RNC whose number is less than the relative range between the groups regardless of color. A plus one is added to the RNC for the following. For every movement card currently present on the opposing group, if the opposing group is an AFV, if the opposing group has been fired on by another group during this player turn, or if the opposing group fired during the last player turn, if the group doing the observing is a buttoned up AFV, then one is subtracted from the RNC. If the detection is successful, it does not cost an action. The group may take any action that could normally happen during daylight on the opposing group. If the detection is not successful, then it does cost an action. The fire strength of the night attack is halved with fractions rounded down, save for ordnance, demolition charges, snipers, and minefields. If the firing group is moving, the fire strength would be halved twice with fractions rounded down each time. If ordnance is moving, it would require a black RNC and deducting one from there to hit frequency. If the observing group contains an unpinned squad leader, they may place a star shell one chit on the enemy group as their sole action for the turn. At the end of the turn, the chit is flipped to its star shell two side. At the end of that turn, the chit is removed. Star shells illuminate all enemy groups at relative range 5 to the detected group. Plus, all adjacent friendly groups at the same range are illuminated as well. Groups illuminated in this manner are not subject to observation attempts or night fire effects. If an attacker attempts to infiltrate, a shift of three columns to the left on the RPC is made for checking infiltration status. This does not apply if the enemy group is illuminated by a star shell. And that is how you conduct night combat in up front. Mm -hmm.